food for thought. Y'all open to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. And then we're going to start in verse 21, but I'm going to pray before we get started. Father, I thank you for your love and your mercy in our life. And Father, may, may what is said this morning, may it shape us, mold us, but Father, that it, uh, that it speaks of you, that it speaks of, of you guys, that it speaks of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that in the unity and the communion that, that y'all have, that Father, because of what you did through the incarnation, through your Son on this earth, we have been brought into the family of God. And that, Father, we have this tendency to make it about all this other stuff. But, Father, Christianity is about family. It's about connection. It's about fellowship. It's about being brought into the Trinitarian love of God. The fellowship that's been going on before the foundations of the world. And that, Father, your goodness has brought us into that. And, Father, that is the good news. Is that you brought us into your life. And as as, you, as Paul said, that, that that joy, that the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but it's joy and peace in the Holy Ghost. And Holy Spirit, just implant that in people's hearts, minister that to their hearts and minds this morning, and may it just shape us and mold us to look like you. And I thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Amen. All right. Something on a side note. How many of y'all like like um, Marvel comic stuff? I, I love I love like the Avengers and all that stuff. Just on a side note, um, I, I I was watching some of that this past week, and did you know Thor? Right, Thor is one of the one of the the Marvel comic guys, right? Yeah. Thor, and Odin is his dad. And something that was just kind of dawning on me as I was watching that. You know, those are Greek gods. Y'all realize that, right? Greek mythology, Greek gods. What's interesting is, is that Paul, the Apostle Paul, go, in Acts, goes to Mars Hill. This is where all the Greek philosophers was, right? And so he goes up there, and they have all these statues to all these gods. All right? Lined up. And they have this one statue, and it says the unknown God. Because they, it's like, there's so many gods that we don't know, so we're going to make one to the unknown God. That way we don't miss anybody. All right, so if there's one we miss, we can just label him the unknown God. All right, so Paul goes up there, and he's like, let me tell you about the unknown God. Let me tell you about the real God, the only God that there is. And so he starts telling them about Christ, and what he gets to, he gets to the resurrection and that Jesus rose from the dead. Alright? What's interesting about that is they had this thought, man, death is final. It's fine. It's the final curtain call on your life. But if somebody can defeat that, man, this guy is super powerful. This guy's powerful. Somebody who can rise from the dead is super, super powerful. And so here is Paul telling them about Jesus. And what's interesting about that. In that context, in that text, Paul, this is what Paul says. He says that it's in him that we move, live, and have our very being. Do you know that you are moving and living and have your very being inside of Jesus? We are inside of him. This world is inside of him. Nothing exists apart from him, Paul said. All things exist by him, in him, and for him. And you know what he tells a bunch of pagan worshipers? That it's in him you live, move, and have your very being. It's in him that all things exist. And he says that we, that we grope for him, basically like blind people, trying to find him, trying to, trying to describe him, trying to, trying to understand him. But here's what's great about this. Let me tell you what's awesome about this. Is that he says, Jesus, who is God incarnate, comes down and shows us who God is. Shows us who they are. 
So instead of groping and looking and longing and all this stuff, we now have this perfect example of who God is. And you know what? He looks completely different from Odin and Thor and all these gods of the all these these mythological gods. Because you know how they built their kingdoms? What's interesting in the in the Avengers thing, Thor and Odin, their job is to uh, keep the nine realms in check. And you know how they keep them in check? Through war. Through violence. Through and is that not man's way today? That we keep people in check by suppressing them, by, by being above them, by trying to be better than them, and all this stuff, and so we suppress people. But here's Jesus' kingdom, and he comes down and says, no, let me tell you about God's kingdom. Man, it's people who wash feet that are the greatest. It's the people who serve that are the greatest. And so he's completely backwards from everything man had created about all these gods. Completely upside down kingdom. And he says, no, let me tell you about Jesus' kingdom. Let me tell you about this, man. Love conquered all. Love resurrected from the dead. So you mean that love and grace is more powerful than violence and hate and, and pride and all this? Absolutely. And so he shows us who God is in Christ. And so I was watching the Avengers this week and I thought, man, that's a perfect example of how man sees God, but how different that is from what we see in Christ. We're followers of Jesus, right? His kingdom. His ways, right? So what's interesting about that, now pick up in verse 21. It says, Philippians 1, 21 says, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which to choose. That's a crazy statement. He's like, if I die, it's gain, but if I stay, it's fruitful labor, so I don't know which one I want to do. Alright, that's somebody who's just wrecked by Jesus. It says, but I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that would be very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Oh my God. I want you to think about something. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5.16. Paul's talking. He says that. He says, having concluded, he says, therefore, we judge no one according to the flesh. Having concluded that if one died for all, therefore all had died. What he's saying is, is that he would look at somebody. He would look at Davy Joe right here. And you know what he would see Davy Joe? So he also writes in, I believe it is in, in Acts, that might be right, but I think it's Acts where he talks about that we have treasure hidden in earthen vessels. You know what that means? Do you, I watch Gold Rush on TV. How many of y'all watch Gold Rush on TV? They go through a ton of dirt to find some gold. Do they not? I'm talking about thousands upon thousands upon thousands of yards of dirt, and they'll be like, They'll get like a piece of gold this big around. They're like, oh my gosh, look at look, that's gold, right? And I'll be like, man, you worked like 12 hours for that piece of gold. <laughs> but my point is, is the dirt does not hinder them for seeing what is possibly in that. Does that make sense? So we have treasures hidden in earthen vessels. So God's eyes, when you have spiritual eyes, I look at Davy Joe and I don't see the flesh. I see the treasure that's hidden in that. Does that make sense? So now I'm seeing people and I can see past their failures. I can see past their faults and, and I can see what is hidden in them that is good. That Christ put there. Does that make sense? So now I'm walking in a way that, and this is what Paul gets to. He says, because of this fact, and I believe this is the same, I believe this is the heart of what this is talking about. I believe when we get to that point, it would be like, man, I do this, I do this because I want to. I do this because I am compelled or I am propelled by the love of God in my life. And so what's interesting about that, in that 5, 16, 2 Corinthians, he says the love of Christ controls us. Not our love for Him, but His love. His love itself 
is now controlling my life. And so I can literally walk out Christ-type love with people. Does that make sense? And when I start seeing that, and I start seeing David Joe, and I start seeing Joanne, and I start seeing Chuck, and I start seeing, I start seeing these people as God sees them, guess how I will now treat those people? I will treat them how Christ treats them. I will see them how Christ sees them. And did you know that Christ sees the end from the beginning? And did you know that faith sees that in people? Faith sees things in people and sees that treasure hidden in earthen vessels. So here, keep on reading right there. It says, Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. So Paul's like, if I stay around, man, I'm just doing it for you guys. That has nothing to do with me. It has to do for you. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. Verse 27, this is where we're going to stop and talk for a little bit. It says, Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit. Say one spirit. All right, they're standing firm in one spirit. All right? And it says, with one mind, so one spirit, one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. All right? For the faith of the gospel. This is what I want for us to understand. The finished works of Christ, what He did on our behalf, and what Christ did, He did that without any of our permission. Did He ask any of us if He could come and die for us? He did that because He loves us, and He did that because He's sovereign, and He did that because He can. Alright? So, the faith of the gospel, I want, you to, I want you to understand something. We have faith in the gospel, but he says there's something about fighting and striving for the faith of the gospel. Meaning that the gospel is its own inherent thing. You understand what I'm saying? It is its own inherent life that is true whether we believe that or not. You understand what I'm saying? That is true whether we put our faith in that or not. Okay, gravity is true whether you believe that or not. Okay, I can't go, I don't believe in gravity, I don't believe in gravity, and start floating. Right? Because gravity is a truth. Alright? The truth of the gospel is that Christ did this. Alright? And here's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about faith for just a little bit. We have this idea, and this is what I was taught. I was taught that my faith got me something. That I would put my faith into it and then therefore I received something. But see, the problem with that believing is that puts now receiving something from God based on something I gave God. So now I have nullified the grace of God. You understand what I'm saying? Grace is unmerited favor. Meaning that I don't get grace because I believed in it. I got grace because he sent grace. Y'all with me? I do that. I wish I had a board up here. Alright? Because I do this all the time. We act like the incarnation never happened. We act like here's man, here's God, and we now, our faith, bridges that gap to God. Listen, God sent his son in the incarnation, and he bridged that gap for us. He came to us. That's the paramount about the scripture that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the who? Ungodly. Now, who is the ungodly? I believe he's talking about you and I, right? While we were yet sinners, he died for the ungodly. Meaning that when we could not bridge that gap, he bridged that gap and he came down and he showed us Love. Now, what can happen is, is we think that you put your faith in that and that becomes true. Listen, your faith or not faith does not make that not true for you. Your faith, you know what your faith does? Your faith doesn't get that. Your faith 
sees that. See, faith sees because we walk by faith and not by sight, right? See, faith sees the finished works of Christ and sees that, wow, you mean that he came, he did this, he set me free, he did all of this, grace, unmerited favor, faith doesn't get me in on that. Faith sees that and goes, oh my gosh, look at the truth. Look at the reality of his kingdom. And you know what faith does now? Faith doesn't get me in, faith interacts in that. Faith goes, oh my gosh, you mean that I am set free? So I'm going to live as somebody who's set free. You mean that you mean that Christ, Jesus, His finished works, delivered me from all my addiction? See, faith doesn't try to get in on that. Faith sees that it is. Faith sees that He done that for me. And so faith now goes, oh my gosh, that is, that's who I am. That's who He is. Then faith lives like that because it sees that as truth. But see, what happens is, is we think that our faith, because here's what can happen. How many of y'all ever, how many of y'all ever, uh, we'll just put it like this. When you were born again, right? Salvation, when you believed. Did that become a solical thing for you, emotional? When you felt that for the first time? You understand what I'm saying? Or are you like, oh my gosh, you God touched you and there was maybe healing or or God touched you and you you that become real for you. You felt that it become it become tangible for you. You literally felt that. Y'all had those experiences? This is why I think this can be misunderstood. Alright? The reason we this can be misunderstood is because we'll hear the good news. Alright? Hear the good news. I'll use salvation, for instance. You come, somebody comes, and they hear the good news that, man, Jesus died, died for you as you, and, man, you, you can, in Him, you are saved, and you're free. And all of a sudden, it's like, man, that's, that's good news. And so it's, a heart change happens, right? And that becomes a soulful experience. That becomes a real experience. You feel the love of God. You can literally feel His presence on you. Physically, I mean, you can feel that. Here's what can happen. We think that because we used our faith, that that's when that happened for me. That's not when that happened for you. You know when that happened for you? Guess when your resurrection experience, guess when your resurrection really happened? When he rose from the dead. 1975, November 5th was just the day you saw it and experienced it. You see what I'm saying? So faith now has seen that. It become a real experience. And so sometimes we can interpret that as my faith got that for me. No, Jesus provided that for you. Faith seen it and then it become a real experience for you. So faith now is not trying to get from God. Faith is seeing what He's already provided in Christ for me. So now, the more I grow, the more my mind changes, the more repentance happens, the more I'm seeing myself renewed in Him that has always been true for me. Do you understand what I'm saying? That is not true for you because you believe it. That is true for you right now. That's the reason one day we will know how we've been known. Yet, are you always me? I'm getting some looks like, what is he saying up there? Are y'all tracking with me? Yeah. All right. So now, I'm not trying to get. I'm not trying to get. I'm not using my faith to get. I'm not, I'm not fighting. Ah, not fighting against flesh and blood. Not fighting against that stuff. I'm fighting. I'm striving for the faith of the gospel. Of the gospel. Meaning that this is a done deal. So my faith is now placed, not in my faith to get, but my faith is placed in that He's already provided that for me. So that's why I'm fighting for the faith of the gospel. The, the gospel is its own inherent thing. It has its life apart from that. The party is going on. It's our job to see it and interact in it. So now I'm not trying to even get... Uh, I'm not even trying to get in the party. He brought me into the party. You know the parable Jesus talked about when He invited everybody to the party and nobody would come? 
the king. He told the servants, to go out and go to the highways and byways and bring those people in. We're there because he brought us in. You understand what I'm saying? So the life of God, the kingdom of God, which is, by the way, joy and peace in the Holy Ghost. I mean, I want joy and peace in your life. All right? That is already going on. You don't have to fight for joy and peace. Listen, joy and peace are fruits of the Spirit. You understand what I'm saying? Listen, I'm not trying to fight to have joy. I'm not trying to fight to have peace. What I'm fighting for is that anything that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, that's spiritual warfare. He wages war against, in our minds, did God really provide all this in Jesus? Is that really true about you? You know, I don't know if that's really right. I don't know if that's really true, you know. I don't know. No, this is who I am in Christ. This is what He has done. Faith merely sees that and goes, that's who I am. That's why it's the perfect law of liberty. The perfect law of liberty. We see into Christ and we see how free we are. We see how much religion does not have a hold of us. We see how much sin does not have a hold of us. We see how free we really are in Christ. Does that make sense? Now, that is true for you right now. And there's things that are true for me. We walk around like blind as a bad people. I don't know if y'all realize that or not. We're blind as a bad people. That's why you need the Holy Spirit. He leads you in all truth, right? Did you know that the Apostle Paul, when he was Saul, when he got knocked off the donkey, right? What happened to his eyes? They got scales put on them, right? And that was a physical thing that happened to Paul, but it was a type and shadow of how he was spiritually. Y'all with me? That's how he was spiritually. And so, boom, who are you, Lord? Strikes him blind. So Paul's groping around. Remember what I was talking about earlier when he was talking to the, uh, the Greeks up on Mars Hill? He said, you grope. Why do you think we have all these crazy ideas about God? Because people grope and try to understand Him, try to explain Him, and they had all these crazy ideas, and then Jesus is like, no, nobody's seen the Father but me. I am the express image of God. If you want to know how He is, look at me. And His kingdom's completely upside down from all religions everywhere. And He says, no, man, I've come to love you. I've come to show grace. I've come to show mercy and love and acceptance. And so what happens is, is Paul, boom, did you know that he said that he did things ignorantly in unbelief? Unbelief. He was blinded, right? Belief doesn't get you anything. Belief sees the kingdom. Belief sees what Christ is and who he is and what he's already done for you. Belief doesn't get that to be true. Belief sees that it is true. You understand what I'm saying? So now my faith... It's not placed in my faith to get. My faith is placed in what He has already done for me. So now faith just sees and interacts in that kingdom. And so here's Paul. He's blinded. He's blinded and he goes into Damascus and they send Ananias to him. And Ananias prays for him. And this is what Ananias... Did you know that what his name meant? Ananias means the one whom Jehovah graciously has sent. Ananias means grace. And so Paul has this grace awakening, boom, and the scales fall off. Why? Because he seen. Now flip over to Galatians real fast. This will this will this will mess you up right here. Start in verse four, uh, 13, chapter 1, 13. This is about Paul, right? He was blind. But listen to what he says. Actually, start in verse 11. For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of who? Ah, he could quote the entire Old Testament verbatim, but he missed the revelation of grace. Until he had a Jesus encounter. Yeah, 113. Yep. 
Actually, that was verse 12. That's verse 12. For I neither received it from man nor as I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of who? You won't understand the gospel until you have a revelation of Jesus. Because He is the revelation. He's Mr. Revelation Himself. He's Mr. Grace Himself. He is all things. Listen to what He goes on to say. For you have heard of my former manner of life. That's when He was killing Christians, right? In Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. But when God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb, and called me through His grace, was pleased to reveal His Son in me, so that I might preach Him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. Paul was called while he was persecuting the church. He was set apart the whole time he was persecuting them. But he was blind. He was blind to the life. Blind to that. And do you know what faith did? Faith, grace, boom, removed the scales and he seen the life that he had been set apart for the whole time. Did you know that in your life God has set you apart and when the blinders come off, it sees what's already been provided for me in Christ. And so now I come out of darkness and into the, what? Light. I was once blind, but now I see. I am now out, transferred out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. And listen, that is an ongoing Process, not out of the kingdom of darkness, but the removal of the blindness in our life. So, what I see constantly is what He has done for me, who I am in Him, what He has provided. That is the gospel. The gospel is not true because we believe it, the gospel is true because He did it. It is a true statement. So, I see that. And the blinders come off. And I see that I am loved. And I see that I am accepted. And I see that I am forgiven. And what happens is, is I receive that. And I go, oh my gosh, that is who I am. And that's how I walk in this life. And see, what happens is, if you want to flip back over there, I'm going to go back over to, to Philippians 1. Or actually, Philippians chapter 2. Verse 1 says, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete, being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in the Spirit, intent on the purpose. You know how you do that? You know how we do that? We make this thing about Christ. We make this thing about Jesus. We make this thing about what He did for us. And do you know that's the uniting factor amongst every one of us in this room and the people that don't go to church here? Is the uniting factor about the family of God is what He did to unite us to them. I'll say that again. The uniting factor about all of us is what Christ did to unite us. Why do you think we, we say brother and sister, right? I love you, brother. I love you, brother. But that... Because I, I, I think I've thought about this. You can say that stuff. But do I, do I truly see them like my brother? Like I, would, I, have a, I have a brother named Keith. Do I have the same attitude towards them or affection towards them as I would my own blood relative. But if we've been brought into the family of God, we literally are brothers and sisters in Christ. Literally are. Bound together because of what He did. Because see, He goes out and He gathers. He gathers. 
And He makes a family. And we've been brought into that triune love of God. And so because of that, you have to understand that. Because of that fact, that's why I live the life I live. I live the life I live of love, grace, mercy, and forgiveness. I live the kingdom because that is who I am. I was watching a deal the other night. This famous uh, um, musician, I won't mention his name, but he was, uh, they are having a, a celebration about him. And at the end of it, he played and sang some of his famous songs. And he got up, and this is what he said. He said, I love you whether I know you or not. He goes, I love you. And he said, the reason I love you is because the God I serve tells me I have to love you. Now, that sounds all right on the surface. But the problem with that is, is I don't love you because I have to. If I'm loving you because I have to, I've missed the whole point of the life of God. I'm not having faith because I have to. I'm not having this stuff because I have to. I'm having this stuff because it is the life of God operating in me. Does that make sense? And so every time the blinders come off and I see, I step into more truth, I step into more life, I step into more repentance of who I am, and therefore that comes out as fruit. Does that make sense? I'm not trying to make that happen. I'm seeing the, the vine that I am connected to and I am bearing fruit out of that the more I see Him. See, now Christianity is not about church going, tithe giving, and all that stuff. Christianity is about knowing your Father. Right. It's about knowing who you're attached to. That's why repentance, metanoia, change how you think is so important. I'm changing how I think. Don't be conformed to the world, but be you transformed by the what? Renewing of your mind. So man, I see Jesus. The blinders are coming off daily. Daily. Boom. Oh my gosh. You mean that's, that's how I treat my spouse? That's how I treat my kids? That's how I... I heard a guy this week, and he said something. I was like, we're so far away from thinking kingdom thinking. He said he was in Kansas, and he said that he was talking to this young man who was going to be a pastor. And, and he said that, he, or he said he felt called into ministry, and he said he asked him what he felt called into. He said, pastor. And he said, we're in Kansas, it's flat, farmland. And he said, I want to, uh, I want to ask you something. He goes, you see that guy out there on his tractor? He said, how does that relate to the kingdom of God? He said, how, did, how does that guy on his tractor relate to the kingdom of God? And that, that young boy said, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. And he goes, you better know if you're going to be in Kansas and understand how to talk to people who farm for a living. And he said, because here's what you've got to understand. He said, while that guy is out there farming, sowing seed, harvesting, building crops and doing all that stuff, he said, he's just doing his part of the kingdom. He said, you may be a pastor and you're doing your part, but he said, he's out there doing his part because it's going to feed your family. See, he's working for the kingdom. Right there, sitting on that tractor, sowing seed, harvesting it. Because everything you do has kingdom potential in it. Everything you do, when you go to work every day, you are in your sphere of your kingdom. And so when you start interacting with people, you start doing it with love and grace and mercy and forgiveness and you're pouring your life into what God has placed you in whether that's in your home with your family whether that's at your job wherever it is listen the kingdom of God doesn't magically happen because we got together in the church that is true everywhere you go because it all exists in him by him and for him this world is his it don't exist apart from him and I want to close with this do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also the interest of others. Having this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Because this is what you have to understand about the kingdom of God and about His ways, is that Jesus came to show us a God that's completely humble. That's completely serving. And when we see that in Jesus, we see that about ourselves, 
I'll treat David Joe like I'm supposed to treat him. I'll treat you guys like I'm supposed to treat you. My house will get in order and I'll treat my wife and my kids will all relate the right way because I'm seeing the kingdom of God in my life. Because I've seen it in Jesus. But we fight and we strive not to get it. We fight to see it. And Satan will do everything he can to try to blind us from that. But faith sees everything there is to see about Jesus. And it sees our life in that. And the blinders come off and then we see. And what happens is I see Chuck a little different. I see David Joe a little different. I see myself. I see God a little different. And what happens is, is it starts molding me and shaping me. And now I can be the kingdom to people that I am, my household, the people that I work with, the people that I'm around. Because I'm telling you, the people you're around every day can use more grace and mercy in their life. I promise you. They can. You may think, but that won't work in the situation I'm in. Got to take them blinders off. See? But, but that won't. Got to take the blinders off. Got to see the kingdom. Got to see the kingdom. And now what happens is faith doesn't try to get it. Faith sees it in Jesus that he already provided that for me. Amen? Amen. Amen. Everybody stand. Father, I thank you for all that you do. I thank you for your love your grace and your mercy. And may we understand that the kingdom, Father, your, your kingdom is going on. Father, it's been going on since the foundations of the world. Father, we that party has been happening and that faith sees that and enjoys that life of joy and peace in the Holy Spirit. And that, Father, we're not trying to get that. We have that in you. And Father, that is in us. And but Father, that mind has got to get renewed to see that that way. We see that you have provided all things in Christ. As Ephesians 1.3 says that, Father, we have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And that, Father, that you have provided this because you are good. You have provided this because you have grace towards us and that's your nature to be giving. And that, Father, you gave before we had anything to give. And that we are eternally humbled by that. We are eternally grateful for that. And that we're eternally in awe of that.